Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. If there is anything on which there seemed to be a political consensus in 2021 America, it was about the way most Americans had tired of the war in Afghanistan. At a time when the two parties disagree about almost everything and regard those differences as unbridgeable, war weariness about the 20-year effort in Afghanistan united both Republicans and Democrats, and a determination to find a way out of the conflict was something that, on which... President Donald Trump and his successor, Joe Biden, seem to concur. But what has happened in the last month has reminded us that even if the war was unpopular, a precipitate and disgraceful retreat enabling the foes of America and the West to achieve an ironic triumph on the eve of the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks may have profound consequences that even the most war-weary Americans will regret. The Biden administration, desperate to claim that it had ended U.S. involvement in time for that anniversary, fatally undermined the Afghan government and then stood by and watched the Taliban take Kabul, not only fecklessly throwing away the sacrifices that Americans and their NATO allies had made for 20 years, but essentially trapping many thousands of Americans as well as tens of thousands of Afghans who are now in fear of their lives because of the help they gave the Americans, as well as the roles they took on during a now-ended era of relative freedom. The fiasco was a military disaster as well as a bureaucratic one, as the State Department stalled the paperwork that would allow the exit of Afghan allies. Just as bad, the Biden administration treated the Taliban enemy almost as a friendly power, cooperating with them, handing over information, and pretending as if it were a moderate force against radicals. And throughout this crisis, the president was a font of misinformation and lack of accountability, so much so that even a liberal mainstream press that had acted as a cheering section for Biden since he took office and long before it, had to note that the president was lying about what happened. Ironically, also, the Western European governments that had cheered Biden's replacing of Trump as a return to close cooperation found themselves ignored and also betrayed by Biden would refuse to consult with them. The administration thinks that the attention spans of Americans, as well as their general lack of interest in foreign affairs, and the aforementioned war weariness, will give Biden a pass and that the episode will be long forgotten by the time of next year's midterm elections, let alone 2024. But the problem here is more than a political one. While both Trump and Biden wanted out of active conflicts, The betrayal of allies and the shocking blow to America's credibility has shaken America's allies in the region, including Israel and moderate Arab states, and may well embolden opponents like Iran. And the reopening of Afghanistan to violent, radical Islamist terrorist movements could also recreate the circumstances that led to the 9-11 attacks. To unpack this disaster and to explain its consequences, we're fortunate to have with us someone with intimate knowledge the general struggle against Islamic radicals in the Middle East, and the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mike Pregent is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He's a senior Middle East analyst, a former adjunct lecturer for the College of International Security Affairs, and a visiting fellow at the Institute of National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. He is a former intelligence officer with over 28 years' experience working security, terrorism, counterinsurgency, and policy issues in the Middle East, North Africa, and Southwest Asia, including time spent trying to combat Iranian influence in Iraq as an advisor to that country's government. As a veteran of the military, he served in Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, as well as serving as a company commander in Afghanistan and an advisor with Kurdish forces, and as an expert on extremism at the U.S. CENTCOM command. His writings appear in the Wall Street Journal, the Daily Beast, as well as many other publications. Well, Michael, first off, as a veteran who fought in Afghanistan, got to know its people, what was at stake there, you know, you, you, you rightly say we, this, this has been uh, 20 years in the making, um, mistakes were made, 
by four administrations um, with the lack of strategy and a lack of coherent uh, and consistent approach. Um, and yet it's the, the events of the last two months that are really in focus. Um, I, I think, you know, as you say, you don't recognize these people, but yet they are our military leaders, you know, just from the point of view of the secretary of defense, the command, you know, the chairman of the joint chiefs, um, the head of our armed forces. What does this say about, our armed forces, what does this say about the confidence that Americans should have in them? Obviously, there's a difference between, you know, the, the ordinary, you know, the, the boots on the ground, the soldiers, the people who make the sacrifices and the people who sit in the Pentagon. And yet, this is what the, this is what the system produced and it has a tremendous effect. And we will get into it more about, our, you know, where we stand as a nation. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you make sense of this? This, the last two months have been a recruiting event for terrorist organizations, not one for the U.S. military. We're an all-volunteer force. The force is demoralized. This wasn't a failure of our military. This wasn't a failure of our intelligence analysts. This was a failure of leaders in the intelligence community. This was a, a failure of leaders inside of our military, leaders that basically threw away the Ranger Creed uh, for your audience uh, going to ranger school is a very elite, it's an elite school in the military. And you have to memorize the ranger creed. I, I didn't go, but I worked with these guys that went to ranger school. And Austin went to ranger school and Mark Milley did. And there are two sentences in that creed. I will never leave an American behind and I will never, ever embarrass my country. And both of those were shattered on August 30th. We don't congratulate ourselves, pat ourselves on the back for conducting the largest airlift in American history that did not get Americans out. They got the wrong people out. Out of the 124,000 people evacuated, 6,000 of them were American. 9,000 of them were Afghans with a special immigrant visa. The other 109,000 were in that special category of unknown and non-U.S. citizen. The majority of them, Jonathan, were military-aged males that did not work with us. And the military, I think this is a, again, a failure of leadership. And we've, we've heard some brave voices inside the military that Marine Lieutenant Colonel was relieved after he basically said that, uh, the sec def and the chairman of the joint chiefs should be, you know, held accountable for this. They should, they should tell us why they made these decisions to put Americans at risk and abandon Americans. And why are we shedding praise on Al Qaeda's premier ally? in Afghanistan, the Taliban. When you have the CENTCOM commander, General McKenzie, praising the Taliban, congratulating himself, and then making this statement, we could have stayed another 10 days and we still wouldn't have got everybody out and everybody would still be disappointed. That does not come out of a general's mouth, ever. Every general we've ever read about or, or were taught to be like would not say those things. They are politicians at this point. They should all be fired or resign. And I I'm, have no problem saying that as a veteran of this war and as a veteran of others. And I get to say things that people inside the active duty force cannot say. If they said this, they would get fired. Their careers would be over. They need more voices outside that can hold our leaders accountable. And uh, the press needs to be a little bit more curious about how many Americans were left behind. And a little bit more curious on where is the leadership inside of our military. How is it that, you know, you, you left Americans behind? I was at an event in New York City last night uh, where we heard firemen talk about 9-11 and how they went in to save people and how they lost their brothers and first responders lost, lost their, their brothers. And uh, they were allowed to go in and save people. <clears throat> they knew what the risks were going to be, but they went in anyway. Imagine if they were told they can't go in, telling a fireman you can't go into the fire to rescue somebody. Or, you, you know, that's what happened to our military. The last two days, the, the unit that I used to be with in the 82nd Airborne Division were told to clean up the, the airport to get it ready for transfer over to the Taliban instead of going out there and getting Americans and bringing them back. It, it's an embarrassment. The force is demoralized and the, our leadership is absent. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's a depressing picture you paint, but it's one that obviously is is what happened. One element that you just mentioned really strikes me um, as a member of the press when you say the press needed to be more curious about Americans Left Behind. Um, this was, you know, it, it, certainly in terms of the first uh, eight months, eight, nine months of the uh, Biden administration, the last few weeks, it, it's gotten more criticism from the press, which much of which had acted as its cheering section, um, faithful cheering section until now. But yet yeah, you're right. Um, I think, you know, the, the much of the press, even when they became critical at times, was not that curious about what was going on um, in, in, in Kabul, um, where the Americans are, how many Americans are being left behind, how many Ira Afghanis who, are, who have a right to expect us to try to get them out are, are still being left behind. Um, is, do you think this, this lack of curiosity is rooted in that sort of war weariness and you know, what the Biden administration was motivated by seemingly and what they think will bail them out of this disgrace is that people just don't care that much because they think it's a bad dream needs to be over. I, I see this in the think tank community also. It's, I think this is what it is. It's, it's a, a, uh, the drive for access to an administration. You don't criticize it because if you criticize it, you're not going to get access to it. If you cover the Pentagon or State Department or the White House and you're overly critical of what they're doing, you're not likely to get as much access as you had before. Um, you know, the numbers, the numbers, you know, 14 days ago, the numbers were 10 to 15,000 Americans remain in Afghanistan. And overnight, it shrunk down to 200 remain that want to get out. So the, the own, their numbers from the White House, 10 to 15,000 Americans. And then we know that 6,000 were evacuated. So just doing the math, you, you'd have 4,000 to 9,000 Americans there uh, that, are, that can't be explained. And then the, the caveated language of, well, they, those that chose to stay behind or those that want to get out, you know, that language meant they were basically giving us the hint that they were going to leave Americans behind. It went from 10 to 15,000, evacuating 6,000, that left four to 9,000. Then overnight, it went down to, we've evacuated 6,000, and there's only one to 200 that want to get out. To only one to 200 left that want to get out. And everybody else got put in that basket of wanted to stay. And then the caveated language. Well, they're married to a green card holders, and they don't want to leave because, well, you get green card holders out too. You know, uh, you know legal permanent residents are future Americans. You get them out. There, there are there are thousands of, of LPRs there, of green card holders in Afghanistan. And there are, are thousands of Americans left. And the only, ma the only argument that, that I've seen uh, when, when I make this, you know, when I question this number is, well, they, they said that they messed up the numbers, that they overestimated how many Americans were there. So they gave us, there's only 200 left that want to get out. And the press accepted that, Jonathan. So... The White House correspondent comes back and is interviewed by their network. It's a reporter interviewing a reporter, and then that becomes a headline. And that's not journalism. That's, that's, that's a lack of curiosity. And I do believe it's an attempt to just uh, maintain access. But this is, we don't know how many Americans are there. Even if, even if 50 are left, even if one is left, we don't do that. But to, to go from 10 to 15,000 Americans remain to less than 200 remain that want to get out. And that is troubling language because if you're an American, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's shocking and it's kind of hard to comprehend. Um, I guess I have to, I mean, it's tough to move on from that specific subject, but I, I need to ask also, what can the, now that we've, Create, you know, help create this Taliban government. What do we? What can we reasonably expect from a Taliban-ruled Afghanistan? Um, I sense from some in the administration that they are hoping, praying, wishing that the Taliban will just concentrate on reestablishing their rule and in keeping with that country's history, be an isolated, if extreme, state that won't trouble other nations. But what are the chances? 
that the Taliban, they're just going to hide in the mountain, you know, they're just going to, Afghanistan's going to fall off our consciousness now, though, now that Americans are not fighting there. It's, it's the same team, Jonathan, that brought us the Iran deal. It's the same people that hoped the regime in Tehran would change. Uh, they're offering the same incentives to the Taliban now. If you want access to the, you know, to the World Bank, if you want access to international financing, you're going to have to put a couple women in the parliament. You know, the, the bar is so low for the Taliban to be accepted by this administration. It's the same team. It's, it's Blinken, it's Biden, it's Brett McGurk, it's Sullivan. It's the same team that brought us the JCPOA and this hope strategy. And people in the military will say hope is not a strategy. Uh, hope is something you have for your, your family or somebody that you love. You hope that they do something. If you're hoping your enemy changes, that, that is a really bad place to start. And what I see, what this means for us now, is that terrorist groups are going to go to Afghanistan, train on our equipment, train to move like us, train to dress like us, and then go back in and deploy and act like an American force on the ground. And, and what that means is that they'll, they'll, they'll look like help, it'll look like help is coming to an American that's trapped in Afghanistan or an American somewhere else, and it'll actually be a kidnapping operation. The, the militias did this in Iraq. They kidnapped Americans. They kidnapped five British pretending to be us. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the Taliban, ISIS, and al-Qaeda uh, start showing up in these American three to four Humvee convoys, and Americans trapped there believe help has arrived. And it's actually you know, the Taliban. They've already started to dress like us. I think, uh, I don't think it, I'm not, I'm not pressing here. I'm not looking at a crystal ball. It's just the facts on the ground say that this is going to be a terrorist safe haven and every terrorist group is going to go to Afghanistan. It's going to be a new magnet for foreign fighters. They're not going there to fight. They're going there to train. And then they're going to redeploy back to the Middle East with the, the Levant as a target, Israel as a target, Saudi Arabia as a target, Qatar as a target, Iraq as a target. We're likely to see a revisit of of uh, 2014 all over again with the rise of, of the Islamic State, but it'll be called something else. It'll be, and this doesn't keep uh, Americans from going back to Afghanistan. It actually ensures Americans will be going back to Afghanistan again to target terrorist groups. Uh, this didn't end a forever war. It, it just ended forever trust in America if you're an ally. <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah. The, the the talk about forever wars is a little misleading. Is that yes, you know, wars go on forever, but just just opting out doesn't mean that the war ends. Um, uh, the forever the war ends only book. when the other side decides yeah. to end it too, and they are the not ending it, are they? No, they're not. The enemy has a vote, and they see this as victory. Uh, they are forming their government tomorrow on nine eleven. They'll form their government, and the. Minister of Interior is an Al Qaeda affiliate. Uh, the four, four of the five Taliban captives that uh, President Obama released for the, the poor Bo Birdall, the soldier who left his post, who basically deserted, are have places in government, in the Taliban government. Uh, there's an active resistance in the Panjshir Valley of commandos that we trained over the last 20 years and worked with, and Pakistan, a U.S. ally, is. Is helping the Taliban, you know, squash that resistance. We're not using leverage with Pakistan. We're not using leverage with the Taliban. And the administration thinks ransom payments are leverage for the Taliban. Uh, they thought ransom payments to Iran w was leverage. And it's the reverse. Iran used hostages as pawns, and they got concessions from the U.S. The Taliban is doing the same thing now. Every flight that leaves, there's a, there's a payment made to the Taliban. And that's a ransom payment. That's a release payment. And we are just encouraging more groups to, to attack the U.S. Remember, it was Osama bin Laden that, that thought before 9-11 that if you kill enough Americans, they'll just leave. And for 20 years, he was proved wrong. Well, terrorist organizations were proved wrong. He, he was proved wrong for a decade, and then he was proved wrong on May 2nd, 2011, when he was killed by U.S. Navy SEALs. But he was proved wrong and every jihadist group has been proved wrong. If you kill Americans, Americans will come 
and kill you. That is until August 30th. On August 26th, we lose 13 Americans and we collapsed our security and we left. We gave the terrorist organizations another Mogadishu. We gave them another Beirut's uh, barracks bombing. And now they, they see that under certain leadership, if you kill Americans, they will leave. And it encourages them to continue doing that. Mm. You know, for, for the, you know, you mentioned one interesting and important point about Pakistan's role in propping up the Taliban and indeed helping to supply them and being sort of the co-author of this disaster. Um, that's something though, that those of us who follow these issues closely have long known about, but is, you know, kind of a very gray area. Or most Americans know nothing about it. Explain to us, as we say in the Jewish world on one foot, how it is that a country that is supposedly an American ally has actually been helping an, an American enemy and really facilitated this disaster. We... We basically, you know, we, we ensured our defeat the, the year we allowed the Taliban to, to take the shelter in the Peshawar Valley in Pakistan. You know, the, um, we, we basically ensured our defeat when we gave it that respite every year for 20 years. I mean, every, you know, a lot of people may not know, but there's a term in Afghanistan called the Spring Offensive. And the spring offensive is when the Taliban comes back into Afghanistan and starts attacking everything and, and, t and tearing up what we did the previous year. And, you know, General Petraeus said it in 2007, you cannot defeat an insurgency if it has a safe haven. And it had a safe haven in Pakistan. In those ungoverned spaces, that 30 kilometer buffer between Afghanistan and what the Pakistan government can actually control uh, was used as an excuse the Pakistan government, the ISI said, well, we can't control what goes on in there. It's ungoverned spaces. But they were actually cultivating relationships. They, you know, they built the Haqqani network. Uh, they have their hands in ISIS-K as well. They, they built uh, the, uh, the uh, Pakistani version of the Taliban. And then they, of course, support the Taliban here. The United States has this uh, phrase that they, people in state and the Department of Defense like to use. We're building institutions in order to counter something. So we've seen it in Lebanon. We're building institutions to counter Lebanese Hezbollah, and those institutions simply get co-opted by Lebanese Hezbollah. Or we're building institutions in Iraq to counter Iranian influence, and those institutions get co-opted by Iran's proxies and, and militias inside of Iraq. And we're doing it again with, a, with an ally saying, well, we're maintaining a relationship because we want to keep an eye on Pakistan's nuclear program, the best way to do that is to have it be an ally. And so we're going to ignore everything else. And, you know, to trust Qatar to do these things as well. I mean, why do you think Qatar has a great relationship with the Taliban? You know, I was on a panel with you a long time ago, and I called Qatar mm -hmm. the, the bar in Star Wars. It's the, it's the place right. where, where everybody kind of can, can go, and, and then Qatar uses that as a platform to say, look, we're able to talk to anybody. Uh, they are the evil Oman, in my opinion. Uh, you know, they, they house a base in Qatar, yet they also house the Taliban. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, just that relationship where you see the Russian embassy, the Chinese embassy, the Qatari embassy, and the Turkish embassy will continue to, to operate inside of Afghanistan without the threat of the Taliban. And what does that say? You know, those countries should be punished. One's a NATO ally. The other one is an ally in parentheses, and the other two are ge geopolitical competitors. And what leverage is the United States using? And then, of course, you have the Pakistan issue. It is, um, we've seeded leverage everywhere. We're not feared because nobody thinks we're going to take away payments. We're not, that we're going to stop our funding to these countries, to Pakistan, to, you know, Lebanon and other places, to Iraq. And uh, they take advantage of that. And so we maintain these, these bad relationships because it sounds good uh, at State Department to say that we're building something to counter something. And in fact, we're simply uh, building something that they co-opt and they make us look weaker and they continue to take advantage of us. 
they have the same people in place for, for 10, 20 to 30 years. We change out our team every one to two years. We change our, out our administrations, and they just sit back and wait for a permissive environment. And Jonathan, our enemies have that permissive environment. For three and a half years, they're going to get all they can. And yeah. we've already seen a collapse in Vienna with the nuclear talks. We've seen a collapse in Afghanistan. Who's next? You know, Taiwan's scared. China's not. Ukraine's scared. Russia's not. You know, the Iraqis are saying, are we next? And maybe this was so bad, Jonathan, maybe this this failure in Afghanistan was so bad that the Biden foreign policy team will take a pause and reflect and try not to screw anything else up as bad as this, because this is the biggest embarrassment the the in in my in my my lifetime. We we I've never seen a moment like this. And it's it it uh, it is. Uh, it's an embarrassment, and it has demoralized the all-volunteer active duty force. Yeah. Let's turn for a moment, and you, you just mentioned it, um, about the implications of this for Iran, both you know, in terms of the arms transfers that I have read about with the Taliban giving them some of the treasure trove of American equipment that left, was left behind by the Biden administration, but also in terms of strengthening its bargaining positions in talks with the administration, which, as you say, in Vienna, which is still trying in vain, um, shockingly so, uh, to get uh, Iran to return to Obama's nuclear deal. Um, do you sense any realism about the likelihood of Iran gaining nuclear status, either through Western acquiescence and diplomacy or just a breakout because of its cheating on the weak deal that Obama's minions negotiated. Does the do you think the Biden foreign policy team really think they can talk Tehran into giving up its gains and its nuclear ambitions? They're already operating like the the deal is expired. I mean, they're already at the twenty twenty eight levels, uh, and what I mean by that is the JCPOA expires in nine right. short years. In 2024, ballistic missiles expire. Uh, actually, 2023 ballistic missiles expire. In 2024, uh, they can increase their enrichment. They're already increasing their enrichment. They've never let the UN Security Council resolution on ballistic missiles constrain them. They continue to do that. And in 2025, we lose the ability to impose snapback sanctions. So the administration knew that the JCPOA was bad in 2015. And the same people, again, that brought us the collapse of Afghanistan are the same people that brought us to JCPOA. They are now renegotiating uh, with Raisi, the worst outcome, the, the hardliner in Tehran, and even trying to call him a moderate, Jonathan, try, hoping mm -hmm. that he's going to become a moderate. But my point here is they said in, in 2015, don't worry about the sunset clauses of 2020 with the arms embargo or 2022 with ballistic missiles. We're going to renegotiate all those things. We're going to renegotiate. We're going to extend sunsets. We're going to do all these things because uh, we're going to be a, in a position of leverage then. Well, they had leverage. They had maximum pressure. And because it came from the former administration, they chose not to use it. They ceded leverage. Uh, they have no leverage with Iran. They say maximum pressure isn't working, yet all of the asks from Tehran are to lift the sanctions that Trump put in place. And, uh, and that's a big that's a big deal. Uh, they are that naive to make more concessions and rejoin the Iran deal at this point without renegotiating sunset clauses that expire in the next 24 months is is. I don't understand it. Are they really that bad? Do they really not understand our enemies? Uh, the one thing that Iran will probably do also, the Taliban is not only going to give them. Uh, U.S. vehicles. I wouldn't be surprised if they give them some American hostages. Iran knows how to deal with with Americans. Uh, Iran knows how to how to bargain, you know, and use them as pawns. Uh, I do see the Taliban uh, selling Americans to Al Qaeda, selling Americans to ISIS, uh, ransoming Americans back to State Department on their behalf, and then giving some to Iran as well. Iran has cultivated relations with the Taliban since 2007, providing them lethal aid. Uh, providing them uh, a strategy to keep America entrenched in Afghanistan, to make it bleed on the way out. And uh, Iran looks at what just happened in Afghanistan, and they're empowered. Their militias in Iraq are empowered. Their proxies across the Middle East are empowered because they see weakness. 
They see a weak administration that, that wants to celebrate ending things. They want to celebrate ending the Afghan war. They're going to want to celebrate ending the Iraq uh, partnership. And, and then they're going to try to celebrate rejoining the JCPOA. And every one of those events will empower and reward Iran and our geopolitical competitors, Russia and China. Right. What conclusions do you think Israel should be drawing about its strategic position uh, and the value of its uh, alliance with the United States from what's been happening in Afghanistan? Um, what about its moderate Arab allies? Um, will, like the Iran deal, this force them to, con you know, to cooperate more, get even closer? That was the ironic achievement of, of the Obama administration, uh, bringing peace between Israelis and Arabs, not because of what they did, uh, but in spite of it. <laughs> exactly. Right. Very much an unintended consequence. Or is there a chance, and, you know, sort of looking at the, the negative side, that some of the, you know, some of the people that have been cooperating with Israel, some of the people who have uh, looked at the United States as, as an ally will decide you know, as the expression goes, that the strong horse is not the United States and that it's time to better make a deal with Iran and its allies than to stand opposed to them at a time when the U.S. is, is so weak and is abandoning the field. I think that uh, our allies are, are trying to operate independent of the United States because they believe that's in their best interest. I mean, we heard it from from. Uh, the UK representatives in NATO that basically said, um, you know, we need to get to a point where one partner in NATO can't derail what we're doing. And they were talking about the Biden administration. Israel is already operating independent of that. They've given the United States, you know, deference when it comes to targeting Iran, saying, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll defer to you on that, you know, decision, but now they've moved away from that. They'll, they'll do it on their own because they know they have to. Our Arab allies in the region should look at Iran for what it really is. It's, it's a paper tiger. Russia and China are not truly Iranian allies. They're just there to exploit resources and, and take advantage of a desperate regime looking for cash that will come with consequences. Um, Iran will not risk its own force. They'll, they'll fight to the last Arab, but they, they won't fight with their own people. Their people do get killed in Syria, but they don't get killed fighting. They get killed in, you know, in an intelligence target because they can see them grouping and see them meeting. So <clears throat> I think our U.S. allies should fend for themselves. I think Russia and China are pragmatic enough to, uh, to not want to see Iran to have that much power. They'll like to, they'll, they'll sell, they're already selling weapons to the Saudis. They're already trying to do things that we're not doing. They're selling offensive weapons. Uh, Russia has an interest in seeing that, that Israel continues, uh, you know, continues to have at least uh, detente with, with, with Iran. The, uh, the Syrian, Syrian case is where I, where I cite this relationship. We, we saw Israel bomb IRGC targets on the ground in Syria. And, and By R IRGC, and, just to explain to our audience. That's the, oh, the Islamic uh, Republic and... The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, basically their special operations forces inside of Syria uh, with impunity. And Iran actually complained that uh, why, why is Russia in Syria if they're not there to defend against Israeli airstrikes on Iranian positions? And that's, that's not why Putin's there. Putin's there for an air base. Putin's there for oil and gas rights. And Putin, you know, did not defend uh, Iran against Israeli airstrikes. And that's that's just all I'm saying is Russia and China are not there the way we would be there. They're not there to fix things. They're not there to have a comprehensive strategy to fix a country like Afghanistan. They're there to exploit resources. They're there to fill the gap that we that we just, you know, exited. As we tilt out of these places, they tilt in. And we use the argument of tilting out, saying we're going to focus on great power competition. And as soon as we tilt out of an area, those two great power competitors dip in and entrench themselves. And it just makes the U.S. look unfocused, unserious. And uh, Afghanistan pretty much cemented that for our enemies, that view that America is now weak and retreating. And they're not going to leave us alone. They're going to keep pushing us. They're going to keep trying to take advantage of it. 
and they see the next three and a half years as a very permissive environment. Yeah, do you see a greater chance of uh, sort of things flaring up with uh, Hezbollah facing Israel from the north, Hamas and Islamic Jihad from the south in Gaza? Um, you know, these are these are stable yet inherently unstable conflicts with the, with these terrorist organizations. Do you think the sort of cascade of recent events and the strengthening of Iran? Do you think that makes these conflicts um, more susceptible? to sort of unintended consequences and, and conflicts and perhaps even both sides didn't really intend. I, I do. I think the, the more concessions given to Iran, the more likely that outcome is that Lebanese Hezbollah and Palestinian Islamic Jihad conduct these attacks because they'll see Iran as empowered, uh, having resources, able to pay them, uh, allies with Russia and China to be able to do things. Uh, under maximum pressure, we, we, we heard rumblings inside of Lebanese Hezbollah, like, why are we listening to the Iranians? Why, are they, why do they want us to, to launch all these rockets at Israel when they can't even, you know, protect us anymore? Yeah, even the New York Times noted at one point that they weren't paying their salaries on time anymore, and they were getting upset about that. Right. And, and, and you know, just looking at the recent examples of Lebanese Hezbollah and Israel conflicts, it's basically... You do something to us, let's have a face-saving gesture so we can off-ramp. So there's a, there's a, you know, a tit for tat. And that's what, I mean, Lebanese and Hezbollah didn't get themselves involved in the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad rocket attacks on Israel. And, mm -hmm. and they, they've actually told the Israelis, hey, that wasn't us. It was those guys. And it was the Iraqi militias where the Israelis went into Syria and started hitting uh, Iraqi militias and IRGC Quds Force. It was Lebanese Hezbollah that said, hey, it's not us, it's them. So Israel is, is respected that much and feared that much by Lebanese Hezbollah. And when the United States is strong and backing Israel, that even gives Israel more strength. But in this situation, right. they see the retreat of America. They see an empowerment of Iran. Iran's going to be embol emboldened here. Iran is going to think that once this Biden administration makes all these concessions, that they can rush towards a bomb with impunity. They can start putting pressure on Israel and the, our Arab allies with, with impunity. And that the United States is simply going to not get involved because of the mm -hmm. lessons of these for, forever wars, right? The yeah. 17 years in Iraq, the, the, the 20 years in Afghanistan with nothing to show for it other than handing it back to the Taliban in Afghanistan and handing Iraq to Iran. You know, it, 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 it's, it's that bad, John Glenn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's turn our eyes for a moment back home here. Um, I spoke about war weariness. Um, Americans are certainly remembering 9-11 this month. But I guess the question is, have we reverted to what we once, uh, at what point uh, you used to call a September 10th mentality, are Americans so burned by the you know, disasters in Iraq and Afghanistan that they really think events in the Middle East have, and the triumph even of Islamist radicals, have no impact on this country? There are certainly voices, um, both on the left and on the right. You know, just turn on Fox News at 8 o'clock every night and you're going to you know, talk that anybody who wanted to resist the Taliban is, is a, you know, is a neocon and, you know, selling endless wars. Um, and these are people who speak for a lot of, uh, of Americans are, are, do, do most, do you think most Americans really think that none of this will, uh, will come home to roost that we, we can do, you know, as bad as the Biden administration has been that the consequences for ordinary Americans or for our, for us as a nation are really inconsequential. There, there's going to be more, there will be more attacks in the United States, ISIS, ISIS type attacks. Uh, that that is inevitable with the border crisis, with with the loss in Afghanistan, with the evacuating uh, seventy five thousand military age males that we have no idea who they are. Uh, I'm not saying that the attack will come from those people. I'm just saying, if you're a, a terrorist leader, you see a permissive environment where you can do things. Now, to the question of will Americans support another deployment? Will Americans support sending hundreds of thousands of troops? To a, to a region that I think those days are over. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Americans always uh, understand that the 82nd Airborne is going to go do something, that our special operators are going to go do something, that our Navy SEALs are going to go do something. And that's probably the, uh, the strategy for warfare in the future. 
we're going to fall in on an indigenous ground force and we're going to ask it to do very difficult things just like we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they're going to turn around and look at us and say, are you serious? You're the same country that abandoned the Sunnis in Iraq, abandoned the Kurds in Iraq, have abandoned the Shia protesters in Iraq, abandoned the Kurds in Syria, abandoned the Afghan National Army and its commandos, the Afghan people. And you want me to do difficult things for you, knowing that you're going to just turn around and, and leave, uh, betray us at some point. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, the failures in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan have made it very hard for a future special operator or a future military person who's engaging with local forces to be taken seriously. Uh, that's, that's, that soldier on the ground will mean what they say. The problem is the leaders will change the outcome. Promises are not broken by soldiers on the ground. Promises are broken by politicians in D.C. And it has uh, reverberating effects. The ramifications will continue to fill those for, for, for this is just the new normal now. Allies will not trust the United States. <clears throat> and it makes you wonder whether or not democracies can win wars anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, Michael, you've seen it all, certainly in the last 20 years plus um, in the Middle East, you know, working on these issues from a variety of of contacts. Um, if there is one lesson you would want your fellow Americans to have learned from all these ups and downs and disasters and, you know, triumphs that turned into disasters, what do you think, you know, your your your, your ordinary American voter who certainly doesn't hate his country, wants his country to succeed, but also doesn't, you know, like the idea of being involved in, you know, wars for a long time. What do you, what do you want them to, to learn from all of this? Um, to hold leaders accountable. I mean, I, I think that's the biggest lesson. Don't take most, most Americans haven't paid attention to Afghanistan for a decade and, until the last, like we said, the last, last two months, hold leaders accountable. Uh, we basically vote and then we take, we take a two-year break to complain about what we just did, and then we wait for the next election cycle. Uh, I do believe that the only way to win future conflicts is to do it in a two-year span, to go in, go hard, do it all within two years while you have the political capital, you're in position, you have the same team together, and you just go in and you have a set mission to take back Kuwait, for example, without going into Iraq, uh, to, to have a, a mission that doesn't end up resulting in nation building. Uh, we are not good at that. Uh, you cannot do that if you change the, the foundation, change the blueprints every year in hopes of achieving something. And, you know, you have to just go in, have it an intel, special operations focused mission, kill bad guys, send them messages and teach them that this is what happens when you, when you mess with the United States instead of going in and then having this relationship evolve to uh, to the point where we are today, where the Taliban started off as a facilitator for the 9-11 attacks by allowing al-Qaeda safe haven. And after 20 years, they're now called partners on the ground. That it does nothing but empower our enemies and makes us look like we don't understand the region, we don't understand the culture, we don't understand anything. And I would say that, uh, you know, the, all the institutional knowledge of this conflict, Jonathan, are out, they're outside of government. There's no institutional knowledge inside government. And, and the people that know better end up becoming politicians. The closer a general gets to Washington, D.C., the more that general looks like, you know, turns into somebody that the force doesn't recognize anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that's a long answer, but, but it's, uh, there are a lot of things. The American people should be demanding that, uh, that the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs resign that the Secretary of State resign. And, mm -hmm. and the cynicism that you mentioned where this Biden administration hopes that Americans will simply forget this. Our enemy is going to remind us of this every year. Our enemy is going to remind us with, with an execution of an American in, on, on their knees in front of a terrorist flag. Our enemy is going to remind us of this failure by creating more havoc, by taking advantage of this permissive environment. And we are going to continue to send young Americans back to these conflicts because we don't get it right. And staying out of it, unfortunately, is not an option. Yeah. 
do you see any reason I, you know, you paint a bleak picture, but a very realistic picture. Um, and we're certainly speaking in a very low moment, um, one of the lowest moments in terms of America standing, you know, in, in living memory. Do you see any reason um, to be encouraged that Americans can learn some of these, can, you know, can can assimilate some of these lessons and learn from them and uh, not repeat these mistakes? Or, you know, is, you know, <laughs> you know, every every generation has its its, you know, uh, its paradigm. You know, uh, we got into Vietnam in part because people remembered Munich in the 30s. And then we got into, you know, we we. Um, we remembered Vietnam so much that we were, you know, sort of letting the Soviets have their way in the world. And then, you know, post 9-11, we seem to want to learn that lesson. But now with time, we seem to have, as I say, be back in a September 10th mentality. Is is there any end to this cycle of learning and unlearning important lessons for Americans? I think Americans don't care, Jonathan. I mean, they can tune this out pretty easily. Uh this, this is a, a new story for them. It's not a new story for the military. It's not a new cycle mm -hmm. is what I meant to say for, for the military. Yeah. It's not a new cycle for, for people who care about this. And uh, I think this will have uh, impacts in the 2022 elections. And I think this will have impacts in the 2024 elections. Our enemy is not going not gonna to let us forget what we just did. Tomorrow they're going to celebrate uh, by establishing their government on on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. They're congratulating themselves for defeating the United States. And there are thousands of Americans and green card holders left and, and Afghan allies. There's 90,000 Afghan allies left there that will start to be executed. They're already being executed, but they'll, mm -hmm. be, they'll start to be used as propaganda uh, for propaganda purposes to remind us of our failure and to remind people across the Middle East and other places that you cannot trust the mili you cannot trust the United States. This was an American ally, and look, they abandoned him, and now we're killing him. And and it's it's the reality. I I know I paint a, a bad picture, but you just gave every terrorist organization a recruiting video, a recruiting campaign message. We this is a self inflicted wound that is fatal. You know, this is this is forever ended U.S. credibility in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, in the Middle East. The only we need one of those, uh, you know, we need a George Bush 9-11 moment. We need a mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan, you know, Operation Praying Mantis moment. And we need to reestablish deterrence, you know. It, we did that with Qasem Soleimani, and then we walked away. Too short, too, what, 18 months later, Iran is already in power. Iran is already being, uh, you know, this administration is already making concessions towards this regime after the Trump administration established deterrence, put mm -hmm. maximum pressure in place. Uh, I don't believe this would have happened under the Trump administration. I was against negotiating with the Taliban. I was against them releasing 5,000 prisoners. I was against the conditions that the Trump administration put in place, but I do not believe that the, the president would have allowed Afghanistan to fall back into the Taliban's hands. And, you know, we advised him not to leave Syria because of what happened in Iraq when Obama left. And that security vacuum led to ISIS. So the threat of failure, the threat of losing a country to a terrorist organization would have kept, would have kept Trump from doing this. And, uh, Again, I'm not advocating that we should have stayed in Afghanistan without a winning strategy. That's my caveat. We have to have yeah. a winning strategy. And a winning strategy in the war on terror is to stay, unfortunately. Stay involved, stay engaged. Well, I think those are important uh, important lessons, important, you know, important uh, ideas to understand. Um, you've given us, uh, Mike, a lot to think about, a lot to absorb. Um, I want to thank you for coming on and uh giving us so much of your experience and insight it was uh revelatory um thank you, thank you also right. to our audience uh for tuning in um whether uh watching us on youtube or eventually on jbs tv where it will be rebroadcast um and on spotify amazon google and all the other uh, podcast platforms where we are heard please like 
uh, subscribe, uh, give us good reviews wherever you listen or watch this. Thank you again for uh, tuning in. We're going to be taking a break for a couple of weeks because of the Jewish holidays, but we'll be back later in the month. So wishing you again, everyone, a Shana Tova, Happy New Year, um, even with some of the bad news we've been discussing. And we'll speak to you soon. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.